Welcome everybody to the Cape Elizabeth School Board meeting, Tuesday, February 11th, 2020. Um, if we could all stand to pledge the allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Can I please have a motion for item two? I move we approve board minutes. As far as where we are, approved yes. board minutes for January 14th, 2020. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Okay. Do we have it adjustments to the agenda tonight? Oh, I missed that. I saw that as a Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you, dear. Uh, so we're going to backtrack and go to adjustments to the agenda. I skipped an item already. Mm -hmm. Yes. I have two adjustments. Um, 7D should, the uh, administrative contract should be 2020 to 2023. 20, so we need to make that adjustment. And then um, in 7, that's 7B. And then in 7D, we need to remove the field trip because it already happened. <laughs> Oops. All right, are there any other adjustments to the agenda? Okay. And then 7B, you got that? Yeah. I heard D, B. 7B. This, this end of the table was confused. Oh, sorry. It's okay. 7B and 7D. Yeah, so that okay. should be 20 to 23. That was 20, 20, yes. 20, yep, yeah, that's correct. 20, 20, 20. Okay, next is comments by student representatives. Hello, um, things in my high school are going really well. Um, and this upcoming Friday, we have our safe day, which is the sexual harassment and assault awareness day for um, juniors and seniors, which I know a lot of people are really excited about. Um, and so how it's gonna work is there's gonna be multiple breakout sessions. Um, so students will be going to different um, talks and activities and stuff like that all to gain awareness around the subject. Um, one of them is sexual, is um, um, we have one about helping a friend and another one about self-defense and activities like that, which students are really excited about. Um, and for the sophomores, they will be doing a job shadow day. Um, and for freshmen, they will be doing um, community service um, within the town, which is super exciting. Um, and also juniors have begun starting their SAT prep in school, um, which I know last year got really positive feedback um, because I know a lot of times students sometimes can feel a little bit unprepared for the SATs, especially if you have to study for it at home, like by yourself, having that self-discipline, I know for some students can be really hard. Um, and so having it built into their schedule, I know just really helps prepare kids over from now until April, which is super beneficial for them um, and working on Khan Academy and with Mr. Wagner in the AC. So that's what's going on in the high school right now. So all good things, yes. Great, thank you so much. Uh, and we have a few presentations. Uh, oh, sorry. Comments from public on the agenda. Okay, seeing that there's none, now we have um, a presentation. If Mr. Shedd would like to oh, well, I think, um, come up. Representative Carney's here. And Representative Carney. Would you like to step up as well? Here is the. Oh, and Senator Millett. And Senator Millett, thank you. <laughs> Okay, so I'm here, I was asked to say a few words um, about Sarah Beckel, who's the coach of the year. Uh, we're very proud of her, and very proud of her work with the volleyball team. Uh, I will say that in the year since uh, Sarah has taken over the, the volleyball team um, for Cape Elizabeth High School, the, the, it is such a cool atmosphere in the gymnasium. 
they draw lots of fans because they do really well. Um, they have huge numbers of boys and girls who come to support them and parents and grandparents and everything else. It's a, if you haven't seen a volleyball game, because I really had not seen an organized volleyball game before I started going to the games here. They are so cool. I mean, and, and rarely does anybody get hurt, and so that's really cool. They cooperate with one another pretty well. Um, we've been super competitive. We won the state championship. I think we, I, I didn't look up the stats. We've won it maybe twice. Uh, under Sarah's leadership, and we've been in the state finals um, in most, if not all, the years when we haven't won the championship. Um, Sarah's an absolute joy. One of the things that is, I don't know how she does this, but she knows volleyball. She was a Division I volleyball player in her college. She's in the Hall of Fame in her college. So she knows the game inside and out. And, and you got to see these games because the, they line up in these bizarre ways. <laughs> And I have no idea what they're doing, and yet the, the, the players know what they're doing, and they coordinate so beautifully. They work their tails off, they throw their bodies around, and then whether they win or lose the point, and this to me is a huge testament to the coach, whether they win or lose the point, they get up, they, they give, every, give one another a high five, they shake hands, so they work really hard. They are in really good shape, they are so athletic, so skillful, um, and that is really a tribute to Sarah's leadership. And let me see if there's any. So, and if you haven't yet seen a Cape Elizabeth High School volleyball game in the gym, it's really cool because the players are right there, the fans are right there. It's packed. Um, and and just thank you so much, Sarah, for for just bringing some wonderful leadership and coaching. Um, there is this one position that before I retire, I'm going to learn the name of it, but it's it's the one that wears the other the funny clothes. And that's the one who just throws themselves all over the place. Um, and it is absolutely amazing. So, so I'm here to say congratulations on my behalf and I think that our, uh, for being named the Coach of the Year, Sarah Beckel. Thank you so much. That's uh, it was uh, quite an honor and quite a surprise to be nominated for co or awarded Coach of the Year. It's uh, it's voted on by your peers, and that's a really um, huge compliment to me. But you can't be Coach of the Year unless you've got an incredible group of girls that come in every single day and, and buy into the system. And even if they think I'm crazy, they'll try it and. Um, and turns out being crazy sometimes works. And I'm lucky to have two of my athletes here with me. Um, and I wouldn't be here without my team. We would not be successful. It's hard to graduate with um, 2016, no, 19, 18, I don't know what year we're in. But the year before, we graduated 12 seniors and to come back the following year and make it to the States with a brand new um, team is impressive and it has everything to do with them and the hard work they put in on and off the court and I am purely blessed and it's, a, it's an honor to be able to coach that team. So thank you so much. to include this in your agenda this evening. So I'm Ann Carney, I'm representative for House District 30, which is most of Cape Elizabeth. Do you want to introduce yourself? Rebecca Millett, I represent all of South Portland, Cape Elizabeth, and parts of Scarborough. And um, we had requested a legislative sentiment to acknowledge the fine achievement of Coach Bechtel. This is a, an official legislative act where we acknowledge um, fine achievements in athletics like yours. And so what I'll do is I'll read the text of it and then present the award. State of Maine, be it known to all that we, the members of the Senate and the House of Representatives, join in recognizing Sarah Beckel of South Portland, coach of the Cape Elizabeth High School volleyball team, who has been named Volleyball Coach of the Year by the Portland Press Herald. We extend our congratulations and best wishes. 
and be it ordered that this official expression of sentiment be sent forthwith on behalf of the 129th legislature and the people of the state of Maine. Congratulations. Well, that is really great news. Thank you so much for all you do. Uh, next up is the principal's updates. I'll let you guys figure no. out. Oh, sorry. Gosh, I am not with it tonight. The Cape Elizabeth <laughs> Language Department, State of the State. There's a presentation happening. Would you like to come up to the podium? <laughs> So I was just elected the spokesperson to start off, so <laughs> I guess I'll go for it. Um, I'm Susan Dana, I teach Spanish at Cape Elizabeth Middle School. And um, I guess first of all, I'll just start with an introduction of the World Language Department, actually Pond Cove through high school. Um, but uh, just to back up, we just wanted to, I, I think the last time we addressed the board was 2010. So we decided it's about time, 10 years are many new board members, administrators, so just to kind of give you an update on where we are in the World Language Department. It's a very important department in our, uh, in our school district, so we just want to give you an update. So first of all, uh, we'll start out with maybe Pong Cove. Is Marsha Chase and Katrina Aspinwall, both teach at, at Pong Cove. And then in the middle school, we have Laura Tripp, Lisa Leonard, and Reed Dion, and also Katrina Aspinwall. She's at both Pong Cove and the middle school. <laughs> and then in the high school, we have Monte Torres, Montserrat Torres, no? and then uh, David Peary and Ali Guther. And Sonia Medina in the back, sorry, Sonia Medina. <laughs> so um, I think we're very fortunate in Cape Elizabeth that we've been supported by the community and the school board. We have really a very um, large uh, department um, and, and we really appreciate your support. Anyway, I'm just gonna talk a little bit about the middle school. We're gonna try to do just five minutes each. We realize your time is precious. You do have a presentation, uh, that, that document, and we can share any, any of this as well. Um, so at the middle school, we, um, we have classes in fifth, just, I'm just gonna, so what I'm gonna be doing just for the quickly middle school, the class frequency, some of the methods we use, the global connections, a little bit of global competency. I realize that's a new goal, um, which is great in the school board, so maybe talk a little bit about what we're doing now um, to reach out globally. Um, but so uh, the classes in fifth and sixth grade, so Pong Cove is five, six, seven, eight, or middle school is five, six, seven, eight. So in fifth and sixth grade, classes meet every other day for 45 minutes. And then in seventh and eighth grade, students meet every day, uh, the world language students. Uh, class periods are 48 minutes, so it's every day 48 minutes, the same as science, math, language, arts, science. So again, we feel very supported with the amount of time that we're given with the, with the students. Um, some of the methods that have changed, I think, since we were last year is we're doing more and more with proficiency. You probably hear about that from the high school and some from Pong Cove as well. Um, and comprehensible input where we're uh, just, we do a lot with storytelling, a, a lot with listening comprehension in the middle school level and just trying to get the, the students to understand the language first, the way a baby would learning the language and then uh, move our way up to speaking. Um, so, like I said, I just want to talk a little bit about global competency. It's one thing in, in the packet there, but, and I'm going to go through this very quickly because I'm not going to try to keep this too long. But uh, I just had a meeting earlier with Donna and asking that the board's been kind of struggling with how do you define global competency? And I said, it's not just the Cape Elizabeth School Board, but it's around the country right now. It's one of the standards of ACTFL, which is the American Council of Teachers of Foreign Languages. Um, so I just went quickly to their website right after our meeting, and I'm not gonna read through this, but this is just what they say global competency is. So you can go to ITSE, which is the International Society for Tech and Education. That I like, it's just kind of a bullet. I learn from people of other cultures. I collaborate with others using digital tools. Um, I can work towards common goals. 
goals, um, I explore local and global issues. Now that's from the tech side, but at least that gives you something. But I think the best thing, I think sometimes as adults we go through and come up, what's global collaboration, global competency? This is what my sixth grader said. Now this is from last year, but I just pulled up the, uh, I did a Google form with them. So to see what other schools and people do, and so they can maybe bring that idea or tradition to your city, country, or state. This is verbatim from the students. So, um, so people can learn about how other kids around the world live and speak. It's important to have kids learn about the world and languages around us. Global collaboration is important for students because they need to see and learn about other traditions around the world. It's fun and interesting. And we could go, I don't want to spend too much time, we could go for hours and hours on this, but I just wanted to point that out. But some of the programs that, that we've been doing in the middle school, Worldwide Schools is a free program it's through the Peace Corps and you can be partnered, any teacher can sign up, you can be partnered with the Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, last year I was partnered with Emma Inhorn, and if you know she's a Cape grad, I think 2000, 14, 15, I'm not sure. Um, but she was, a, after she went to, she went to college for four years and then she was a, in Panama, so we were fortunate to be partnered with her. So last year the sixth graders uh, had raised money and we purchased books. They started the very first library. This is a town of 150 people in Panama. And um, it was just really, really exciting. And Emma just came back in December, just last month or a month and a half ago to talk about uh, this project. So this is where they built their, their library. These are the moose, all my students made a moose mm -hmm. to send down, so that's how they decorated the library. So everyone was very excited to see, oh, there's my moose. Um, and those are the books that they purchased 200 books. Each student picked out a title with the money that they earned. Um, and it just, it looks very simple here, but we spent a full year on that. They started geography and, and Spanish terms, and we, we incorporated a lot with, with the language and, and the culture of Panama. Um, Global Collaboration Week, we've participated for the last five years. It's a, we've been both a, a project leader and a participating class. Um, we hosted it just uh, last fall, back to school traditions around the world, and the way it works is anyone around the world during that week can log on to whatever activity you're sponsoring. And it was kind of fun, because we had responses from Egypt, and from India, and Oklahoma, and it's just another easy, it's free, another free program, but a, a way to get students thinking beyond 04107. Global goals, I presented this to the board last year, so I'm gonna kind of zip through this, but the United Nations has a huge initiative for global goals. Um, and then Journey North is a, uh, another program. It's $15 a class, which is actually a really good deal. But all our fifth graders are participating this year and they make symbolic butterflies to send down to Mexico uh, near the reserves where the monarch butterflies go. And these are students, just some of the pictures, the, the butterflies that they made, they each made a little one. We just found out this week uh, that our Cape Elizabeth butterflies have landed in Mexico, so this is gonna be the lesson for the next couple weeks. Um, and there's actually our, our butterflies. The students haven't seen this yet, so it's gonna be part of their scavenger hunt, as they have to go through all the images and find their butterflies. But um, the Pulsera project, where our trip just started this year, was a really successful project where students sell um, handmade bracelets from Central America. And actually, they just got this about three days ago. But I guess we did such a good job that they actually made maracas especially, specifically for Cape Elizabeth, hand-carved. Um, we just made bookmarks. I don't know if you've seen the Thomas Memorial Library, just more outreach. It's, it's local, but they're still using French and Spanish. Uh, so our bookmarks, it, oh, to help Thomas Memorial celebrate its 100th birthday. Um, so I'm just gonna stop there. I think I'm beyond five minutes, but so I've got more. But so this is really quick. But it's very exciting what we're doing in the classroom, and again, we really appreciate your, your support. Thank you. So I guess next is probably Pong Cove. Are we gonna go through the sequence? Well, middle school's out of order, but yeah. Um, I'm Marcia Chase and I teach French and Spanish uh, in grades one through four at Pond Cove Elementary School. Um, I'd like to begin uh, just really by giving you um, a brief overview of our history. Uh, students begin their study of language um, in our district in first grade. And then in alternating years, students begin language instruction in either French or Spanish. Uh, so students stay with the same language through sixth grade. And then in seventh grade, they can choose to remain with that language through high school or choose um, the, span the language they haven't been studying for those prior years. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Pond Cove schedule at present um, for world language. We are structured to have two uh, meeting times, two class contact times over the course of six school days. 
And this averages out to five classes a month. Um, class lengths have varied over the years, anywhere from uh, 30 minutes in grades two through four to uh, 20 minutes in grade one. Um, and this year we're very fortunate because we've been given a little extra time. So uh, we have one uh, in the two, in the six day rotation, we have one 30 minute class and then one 45 minute class, which is more than we've had in the past. Um, just as a point of comparison, the ACTFL, which is the American Council of uh, Teachers on Foreign Language, um, their recommendation is that for minimum basic second language proficiency at the elementary level, that students have to have regular contact time of 60 minutes three times in a five-day period. Um, so uh, another, another thing I'd like to talk about that's been very positive is that in 2017, we got a classroom for the very first time in our history. So prior to this, we had been itinerant teachers. We had always carried all of our materials with us and we went to as many as 48 classrooms in a six day period, not 48 classrooms, but 48 class sessions throughout the school uh, over that six day period, which was, was a challenge. So we're very thankful that we have, um, our program's really been enriched uh, as far as the authenticity of the language environment we can offer by having a regular classroom. Uh, and that, um, uh, so that was, that was just in 2017. Um, we, the original proposal for uh, our world language program back in 1988 was to have a K through four program um, because research of course shows that the earlier language begins, the better, the greater the benefits. Uh, the compromise was to start a program in fourth grade and to then to lower the, uh, the age at which language was begun over the years. So third grade language classes were added in 2000. Second grade was added in 2013, and then first grade was added in 2014. Um, you have on pages four and five of the uh, document we gave you, that's the overview of grades one through four. And I'm going to, I'm going to skip over some of the information there, but um, primarily our second language goals in grades one through four are um, that students begin to develop French and Spanish skills. They begin to develop them, and they, our goal is really to allow for greater facility in world language in grades five through eight. So we sort of set a foundation for, for accelerated learning as they get um, to the middle school. Um, our curriculum emphasizes listening comprehension, speaking skills, and emerging literacy awareness and uh, to uh, promote a positive attitude towards other cultures and other languages. Um, our targets are really uh, to develop skills in communication, culture, vocabulary, and connections. And um, there's a lot more that we do, but I just really wanted to give an overview and a background. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so, good evening, and uh, my name is Ali Guither, and I teach, uh, do I need this? I don't think I need this. Um, and I teach Spanish at the high school. Um, thank you again for giving us the opportunity uh, to share what's going on at the high school with you this evening. Uh, we currently offer 16 different courses, nine in Spanish and seven in French. Uh, this six, these 16 courses service 447 high school kids out of an enrollment right now of 529. Out of those 447 kids, 86 are seniors in a graduating class of 122. 95% of those 86 seniors are enrolled in levels four through six, Spanish or French, which means that they have taken four years of language at the high school, our goal. <laughs> um, one area we have identified uh, a need is an introductory French uh, level. Um, we've not been able to offer a French one level since 2011, which has resulted in A, students be put in Spanish one uh, when they've been studying French this whole time, 
and B, students being pushed into level two when they needed a foundations course to help them fill those gaps. Um, many of those students that were pushed into level two um, dropped out of French after a few years. Our goal um, is that our kids take four years of a language at the high school. Had these students had a foundations course, they would have been more successful and more likely to have finished a four-year program. Um, as a final point, we would like to share with you some results um, of a pilot assessment program that we have um, had this year at the high school. This year, seniors and juniors in level five and six, both French and Spanish, took the ACTFL assessment of performance towards proficiency in language, APPLE for short, um, this past December. Uh, 61 of the 89 students met the State of Maine's standards to qualify for the seal of biliteracy, with another 23 that need to take retake one section at the beginning of March to be able to qualify for that seal. The seal is affixed to, to their diploma, um, and it is also noted on their transcript and recognized by academic institutions and the business community. Um, we are very pleased with these results. Thank you, Kathy, for bringing it towards us, our attention. Um, as a side note, um, last year, the state of Maine uh, granted 183 seals of biliteracy in the whole state, and we already have a third of them. Um, so I'd like to conclude by thanking you again for giving us this opportunity to keep you up to date with what's going on in the foreign language department in this district. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you for that. It sounds like a very strong program, and uh, it was nice to sit in on one of your classes this past week, taking a little test about familia. Okay. Uh, we have next up is a presentation on eSports introduction. Jason Lund. Yes, thank you, Jason. Switch cables. set up here a quick introduction. My name is Jason Lund. I work for the technology department here in Cape Elizabeth. We'll see if it comes up. Do a quick change. So just an introduction uh, as I set this up. Uh, my boss here, Noel Haroff, and I attended a presentation on eSports last spring at a conference. And one of the sessions was on eSports. And I took one in the morning. And I immediately left there and I went to go track him down. And I asked him to please attend to the, uh, after, or please attend the afternoon one. And when he came out, I asked him the question, so how long is it going to take for eSports to be at Cape Elizabeth. And he said, after that, uh, next fall if I can do it. <laughs> so here I am, ready to go. Uh, eSports, what is eSports? eSports uh, is competitive video gaming. A lot of people, when they first hear the term eSports, this is kind of the visuals that they usually see. A bunch of kids playing video games, maybe playing in their garage, so on and so forth. Um, Usually individually, you know, it's not that much of a sport, is it? Let me show you what I think of when I hear eSports. This is a quick video clip that I'm going to show, and I'm just going to show a little bit of it. But this is the League of Legends uh, Worlds 2019 in Europe. There are 12 uh, regional leagues. Uh, North America is uh, the LC L LCS, and this is what happens there. As you can see, it is not a small production by any means. And I want to jump to a little head here. This is the arena in Paris, France, where the finals was held. 
it was the Accor Hotel uh, Arena, which is, seats 20,100 people, uh, and it was sold out. And the biggest statistic I just want to show you here is this one right coming up. Now this is live broadcast, this is peak stuff, so I'm gonna use a statistic that kind of doesn't correlate with it, but I just want you to put this into perspective. Uh, the most watched sport in the world is football, that's soccer for us. Uh, two billion people watch the World Cup. Uh, in the United States, number one sport, of course, is football. Uh, the 2018 Super Bowl is watched by 101 million people. The second sport in the United States is baseball. The most watched uh, World Series of baseball was in 1978, <laughs> and it was watched by 44.2 million people. The 2019 World Series was watched by 13.9 million people. These are world statistics. So this isn't a small sport at all. This is a worldwide growing sport. And of course, with growing sports, there's always corporate hurts. A lot of companies are starting to get involved with eSports, uh, a lot of investments. Twitch, of course, with their streaming along with Mixer, YouTube, Facebook, uh, eSports Arena, and other arenas being built uh, around the world. Uh, we might recognize the Craft Group. Uh, we all probably recognize it. Some of us may love them or hate them, depending. But I just want to kind of bring them up. They actually own quite a lot of different sports. Uh, you, of course, see the Patriots up there, but I don't know if you also know that they own a eSport called the Boston Uprising, which plays in the Overwatch League. Uh, they also own the New England Revolution, which is a soccer team. That soccer team plays in the Major League Soccer, and one of the requirements to be in the league is actually to have an eSports player for the FIFA uh, EMLS Cup that eventually plays on the World Cup. So this craft group that you know and love from the uh, Patriots actually owns just as many eSports teams as they do regular teams. And of course, after big corporations start getting involved, so do colleges. Uh, the history of college and esports is um, quickly run through real quick. But the big parts are in 2016, Robert Morris University in Chicago was the first school to offer scholarships to students for esports. In their first season, they actually had one of their players poached by a pro team. The University of Utah fell, followed suit, uh, being the first school in the Power Five conference to have esports. The University of California, Irvine, uh, up the ante by building a community esports arena on their campus. Robert Morris followed them. Uh, curriculum has been developed by the University of Nevada, Las Vegas, UCI, and Miami University for esports programs. In late 2016, early 2017, we saw the development of official organizations being formed. At the time, NCAA kind of went, meh and was kind of not interested. So it was actually, what was formed was the National Association of Collegiate Esports, the NACE, um, which then in 2018 led to, with those governing bodies, they saw the growth of school participation triple within one year. Uh, speaking of UCI, this is their community lab that uh, anybody who goes to, the, uh, to UCI can come and use these eSports computers. In the state of Maine, we actually have four colleges that participate either in the NACE leagues or a similar league to it. Two of these colleges are now also offering eSports um, management programs, and I expect further colleges to come down. Speaking of which, the NCAA is now very interested in esports and trying to start up a program. Uh, what these colleges see and what schools are starting to see is it's also not only just the players that are involved, it's the entire production. As you saw in that video, you saw a lot going on. So you not only see coaches, you see announcers and talent, you see the entire video production of it. You see media specialists. This is a sport that grew up with media uh, built right into its DNA. 
and a lot of pro teams are looking at, okay, these are how pro teams act. They hire researchers and analysts and health and fitness and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so when you see these programs, they're also expanding these programs where some colleges are also going, oh, hey, we used to be a um, sportscaster program for regular sports. Why are we also not doing it for esports? So it's not only just the playing, it's the entire production that is also uh, opens up students to new fields. Uh, and speaking of students, uh, eSports fits right in with the four C's, the critical thinking, creativity, collaboration, and communication. But it's not also, when I say students, um, a lot of people look right at eSports and say, oh, boys. But quite honestly, if I ask the student population here in the high school, how many of you are football players, you probably get the football team, but if I ask them how many of you are uh, video gamers, I'd probably get a large percentage. And based on statistics, when I look at that large per percentage, I know that eSports will be, as far as when I'm here, and should be a co-curricular program, or a co-ed uh, co program. As far as participation, there are five major leagues right now. Uh, HSEL is probably the biggest league uh, going on, uh, but Play Versus is the new up and comer. A lot of leagues like the HSEL have gone straight to the schools and said, okay, please participate in our leagues, uh, and went at schools in that direction. Play Versus has decided to go in an opposite direction. And Play Versus specifically decided instead of us, well, we're still gonna to go to schools and ask you to play, play in our leagues, but we're gonna look for a partnership. And they went to the National Federation of State High School Associations, and they've started to work with principal associations to develop an esports uh, program for states. Announced last month, the main principals association has signed up with Play Versus as a turnkey league system. And starting in the fall, if 20 teams participate in one specific esports game, it will be a state varsity state championship game. In that same email, they stated that they had interest in over 80 schools in the state of Maine. So I don't think that bar is hard to catch. And just a real quick rundown of this year uh, with eSports. Uh, at the beginning of the year when we first formed as a club, uh, we participated in the club fair that happens. And by the end of it, I had 52 kids signed up. <laughs> a little bit too many <laughs> at that moment in time since we are just trying to get started off. But uh, it showed a large promise and a large, large interest. Uh, towards the end, the technology department sponsored uh, one team for us to participate in Play Versus, and we participated in the League of Legends uh, game. Uh, interesting fact about my team, it was four seniors and one freshman. And it was really interesting seeing those uh, dynamics come together and play together. Um, and we streamed all our games to Twitch and to CETV. We streamed to the channel. We streamed to the live stream of the channel. We also have all our games available on YouTube, Apple TV, and Roku. And this spring, we just started our spring season. I just actually came running over from the high school uh, for our uh, preseason. We were participating in three games. Uh, I have a team playing League of, League of Legends again, once again, play versus. We're also gonna take a look at the HSEL. We're gonna participate with both Overwatch and CSGO. So thank you for the presentation. I also want to use this thank you real quick to Donna, to Jeff, to Kathy over there who attended one of our games, uh, to a lot of the administration staff, Nate Carpenter, uh, Marcy Weeks, uh, who also came to our games and have been very supportive of the program. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Can I ask a question? Certainly. That, first of all, Wow, <laughs> that was really, I mean, I've heard of this recently, but that was my first introduction. And so one, I just want to express tremendous gratitude for, for informing us and teaching us about this, this eSports, which isn't as new as I feel like it, I thought it was. Um, so thank you to you. For high schools it is, especially in the state of Maine. So. Yeah. Um, 
So there was a picture of a bunch of students in a room, uh, and they all looked like they were on, on computers. So I'm just wondering a tiny bit of logistics here. Um, how does it work with them using, do they use their own devices? Do you go into a computer lab? And you said you had 52 students signed up. It was too many. What is your max, and what is the number that you're able to handle right now? And how, logistically, how does it work a little bit there, technology-wise, with the hard, with... I think it was this one you were talking about. Yes. We don't have something like that. No, we do not. So, you know, pie in the sky, maybe we want that, but what do we have? Can you sort of paint a picture of what it's like? So you might have noticed at the beginning of my presentation, and you might not have noticed at the beginning of my presentation, a lot of this core of the presentation is from... Some slides provided to you by CDW. This was the, the group that, ta that uh, we saw the presentation. It's, it's a company that's trying to sell you stuff, but one of the guys that was there was extremely passionate about esports. Mm -hmm. And I'm actually, I do one meeting a month with, uh, right now the core group is two other schools, Westbrook and Waterville. Waterville got a huge grant, anonymous donation grant, to start their e-sports program, e program a year ahead of us. Uh, and so they were able to come up with a couple of core machines. But the guy from CDWG, he said that you have to look at the machines in a different light. You can't just think of them as e-sports devices. Anything it, when we start taking a look at STEM programs, which I am hoping to push as well, any of those types of STEM programs, 3D modeling, video editing, any of those heavy core programs require hardware to actually push those uh, programs. And they need a little bit more oomph than our usual lab machines. So the way I've been approaching a lot of the computers, and we have gotten a small core of computers to start, is those are not go only going to be the eSports program computers. That is the start of the high school STEM program. So that we can start using those devices as well, not only for eSports after school, but during school as well. So a lot of schools are trying to adapt that. A lot of schools are looking at funding. A lot of schools are trying to figure out how to work. The two leagues, uh, HSEL requires a $37 entrance fee, and Play Versus uh, is a $64 entrance tr fee per seat. So it's a lot of trying to figure out how are we going to pay for these things. Mm -hmm. And the group and I, you know, you know, they're dealing with, okay, how do we come up even with that money to be able to participate? A sport like League of Legends, the hardware, we could play on the uh, laptops that we provide to our seventh and eighth grade students if we really wanted to. Each school has to look at what they can participate in, what they can fit, and at least what they can get started with. Um, it's a hard little thing that everybody right now, and uh, fortunately I've got a, a crew of people from these different schools that are sitting down talking about it, that are asking the same exact question, how are we gonna get the hardware? Um, but one of the first things that flew out the door is no, we're not gonna buy those seats that you saw. <laughs> but it, it is a very hard type of thing and it's one of those slow buildups. Um, I have seven computers right now that are decent. And one of the program, one of the things I did when I got the money to be able to build, have those, I actually had the kids come in. They were in the back room here in the Jordan conference room building those machines themselves with my guidance and some seniors' guidance as well. So we took w what we had and I made it something that they could learn from. And they were all excited because they were like, oh, we're gonna take this right now, we're gonna go back, because I was hoping to build a machine, now I know how to do it, I'm so excited. So it's, it's, it's a learning process that everybody's gonna, is facing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, That's great. sounds like you gotta get a boosters group set up too. <laughs> I am desperate for it as well. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Thank, Thank you, you Jason. Okay. <laughs> Principals, I'm on task now. <laughs> Principal updates. <laughs> Jason, would you like to start? I don't want to feel the most 
I was going to say, that's a hard, <laughs> hard act to follow. I'm not so sure about that. Yeah. Thanks. That is very interesting, isn't it? I had no idea. So. Well, good evening, and it's great to be here tonight. Good to see you all. Just, I'll share a few things, a couple updates that I think are really important. It's always hard to pick and choose what to share because there's so many amazing things going on at the school, as you all know. Um, and so I want to just give you an update on our, um, our new student leadership opportunity, the Peaceful Pond Cove fourth grade helpers. So throughout the past few years, something that we have been missing has been student leadership opportunities. So uh, we had a small team of teachers, um, and, and I mentioned this at the last meeting that it was about to be, get up and running. So we had a small group of teachers um, submit a grant to CEIF. So CEIF has really made this possible to fund um, some of the equipment and materials needed um, to help so the teachers can facilitate this group. Um, so the idea is that um, we encourage fourth graders to be leaders in the school, influential in the school, and, and help. And so we now that we've moved a little further in the process, we have 40 uh, fourth grade students who are interested and applied, and they're all accepted and they're participating. Uh, on January 23rd, we had our first leadership training for the team, and it was it was really special. It was after school at the fire station, 3 to 6 p.m., uh, pizza for dinner, and Officer Galvin, myself, Sarah Forey Pettit, and some of the, the key players in this initiative, Tara Bucci, fourth grade teacher, Bree Gallagher, school counselor, Aaron Taylor, school nurse, um, a lot of other people have helped. Tom, our tech integrator Tom Sheltre helped to make um, some videos for the program, and so uh, it's really a, it's a grassroots effort, and it's really working out well. So the the students are. are proud to be leaders of the school and excited to get started. So what they're doing right now, um, the fourth grade helpers, they're filling out interest surveys so we can kind of determine what areas they would most like to help with. And then after break, they'll begin their responsibilities. So I'll just give you um, from this packet that Tara Bucci gave me, uh, some of the um, possible options would be uh, kindergarten lunch buddies, kindergarten recess buddies, hallway helpers. We have um, peacemaker lessons where some students would actually volunteer to help Mrs. Gallagher teach lessons in the classrooms of younger grades. So it's as we continue to, um, you know, develop, build our climate and culture. This is just a, one more example of something that's happening for students and staff, and it's wonderful. So, uh, so also, one more thing. We have a very special visitor, and, and it came about in a really cool way, so I wanted to share this. We have a, a very uh, popular children's author, Chris Van Dusen. He's coming to Pond Cove tomorrow, and he is going to be um, working with reading his latest book, and his latest book is If I Built a School. He's gonna be reading it to all students. We're gonna follow the Allied Arts schedule and the library schedule, and he's going to be reading the books, the book to those students. And so he, Chris was born in Portland, and he continues to be a Maine resident. And if you may recognize some of these books, he illustrated the famous Mercy, Mercy Watson books. So if any of you can remember those, the pig and the children's books. And the circus ship is another one that he wrote. So some really popular books. Also, Learning to Ski with Mr. McGee, there's a whole series there. So those of us that have had young children in the, in the you know, more recent years have probably read all those books with our kids. Um, and the way this came about was, uh, it came Rosenblum, our librarian, actually shared this with me. Uh, there were a group of Pond Cove parents, a small group, were at a benefit auction for the Children's Museum of Science, and they bid on this and won, and then gifted it to the school, his visit. So it, that's really special, too. So another example of that community coming together for the kids. So that's really all I have for tonight. Um, any questions for me or? Yeah. Can I just, I, 
Troy's not here and he perhaps would be the one to ask, but how is, uh, is Peaceful, the, you know, the initiative that you have going with Peaceful Pond Cove, is that being carried into the middle school or is it really just? I'm, I'm not sure of the answer to that. Um, I do know, I mean, this is, this is the second year of it for us. And so, but you know, we have, I haven't been approached about the same initiative following up, but mm -hmm. um, I'm sure Troy could speak to what, similar initiatives they have, but I don't know about that consistency from fourth grade to fifth grade, but it's something to really think about. Um, anytime we have consistency, right, it really supports the transition of those kids to the next level. Yeah. So thank you for that. No, it's a great. We're trying yeah. to make ourselves in alignment. So thank you. Yes. Anything else? Thank you so much. Thank you. Troy's not with us tonight, so. Okay. So we have Principal Shed. So I have two things. One is um, Lisa Melanson, one of the English teachers in the school, sent me an email last week that said that we've had five students recognized uh, for either gold or silver key recognition in the New England, for New England Scholastic Writing Competition. Um, so those students are uh, Lydia Branson, who's a freshman who received a silver, silver key recognition. Claire McDonald is a sophomore. She received gold key and silver keys uh, for different, different things that she wrote. Emma Halter, who's a ninth grader, received gold key recognition. Um, and Lacey Rayback, who is a, sorry, I can't read my own writing. Lucy Rayback, who's a ninth grader. Uh, she had an honorable mention in that competition. And then Charlotte Thayer, who's a senior, um, submitted multiple works and received both silver key and gold key recognition. So that's, that's a really neat sort of awards and I wanted to mention their names. Um, and then, consistent with a theme that I started um, with a long letter to parents today, um, high school parents, um, I did share some information from what's called the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey uh, that was administered in the second week of February, so basically a year ago. Um, it takes a, and it's a survey that's taken by high schools and middle schools across the state. And we got our results just a month or so ago and we've been spending some time looking at those. Um, and as I mentioned in the letter that went out to all parents and students, most of the results were very, very positive in terms of how we fare, how our students report uh, their experiences compared to students across the state. There were, and the purpose of the letter really was to share a number of three specific facts that I think are merit some conversation and have start generated a conversation in high school and we wanted to generate some conversation at home among families as well because that is super powerful in terms of influencing kids' decisions about use. Um, so, so the three facts were, um, the number of students, the percentage of students who report having had drunk alcohol at least once in the 30 days previous to the, to the survey administration. So since the survey is administered second week in February, you look back, so you're talking from essentially early January to early February. So, and that's deliberate because the survey folks want to exclude long holidays, um, which, so, um, so, I mentioned in, in the letter that our students unexpectedly reported a 10% increase in, in number of percentage of students who reported yes to that question of having drunk, drunk, used alcohol at least once before in, within those 30 days. So we've given this as survey a number of times. In 2011, the number, the percentage for that was 22 point, the same question, 22.5%. In 2013, it was 20.6%. In 2015, it was 20.5%, so super steady, flat. Um, then 2019, we didn't do it in 2017, 2019, it, it, it jumped from an average of around 20 to 21, all the way up to 32.4. 
Um, so that's big. Uh, it's a big jump, and we thought it was worth highlighting and sharing that information with parents and having us all engage in conversation about where that comes from. And one of the things that I was surprised by that because there are not signs of it in the high school. We are not having kids coming intoxicated to the high school. Um, this is the first year we've ever had zero self-referrals under the school board substance abuse policy. Normally by this time we have 10 to 20. Last year was a little bit of a dip. Um, and then this year it's literally at zero. We have not had any. Talked to uh, the, our school resource officer, David Galvin, and the chief of police who ver validated what David said, which is that the police are not getting called to break up parties in Cape Elizabeth as they used to. Um, so it's a, sort of an invisible, makes me wonder, you know, what's, what's going on. Um, one of the good news, I think, that comes out of it, and this is just anecdotal, is um, one of our social workers, who's also a sub substance abuse counselor, talks to a lot of kids about substance issues. And one of the things that the kids are very adamant about, and she believes them, is that they are honoring that line of not drinking and driving when they're drinking. So that's good. Um, but that also, then that may in part be responsible for why we're not seeing the signs because kids are not, thankfully, driving under the influence of alcohol. So that's great. Um, but it does raise some questions that I think are worth, we are, we are, uh, we are asking ourselves those questions. And the other number I shared in the, in the letter today of alcohol use is of the 32.4% who reported having used alcohol at least once in the previous 30 days before the survey, 41.3% of those 32.4% said they had drank five or more glasses of alcohol in a, a period of not more than two hours. So it's essentially binge drinking. Um, so if you do the math, 32.4%, 41.3%, it's about, it's 13.4% of our students um, in those 30 days. Um, I will say that the good news is, and there's some concern here that merits attention, but it means the majority of our students are not, and I think this is important, always important to note when you get into discussions about substance use. The vast majority of our, or the significant majority of our students are not using alcohol, and a vast majority of our students are not engaged in binge, binge drinking, but the numbers are up, they've spiked quietly and silently, which is to me the mystery of it. Um, marijuana use, um, same question, past 30 days before the survey, have you, have you used marijuana at all? Um, so the number in 2011 was 14.9% reported yes, they did. 2013 was 14.9%. 2015 was 16.5%, so in the 14 to 15% range. 2019, 25.4%, so again, a 10% increase. Um, that one was less surprising to me because I think, as I mentioned in the letter, um, we, the adult community as a whole, I'm not saying keep Elizabeth, but the adult community as a whole has sent teenagers really mixed messages about um, the dangers of marijuana. Um, and it's pretty well documented that what, whatever you think about legalization or not legalization of marijuana, it is not good for the teenage brain, which is still developing to be exposed to it. So the later students, young people start using marijuana, the better they, they will be in the long term. Um, so, so we see again a sort of a 10% uh, rate, of, rate of increase in use. Um, and so in the letter I say as a school we're looking at some things and having conversations about you know, are there some communication, some more education we need to do, some more communication on our part, but have also encouraged parents to have conversations at home um, among one another and with their kids. Uh, because the one consistent message that you get from any, any research you look at um, is that the single most important factor in kids' decisions whether or not to use or not to use is what the message is they're getting from their parents. There's no question about it. It's far and away um, and the vast majority. So, so I don't know, I don't know exactly, uh, but, but that was the end of the letter is to say, please have these conversations. Um, uh, we've got wonderful kids. They're not going to be perfect. They're going to experiment. Kids our age experimented. We're never going to get to zero, and, and that's un 
unrealistic goal, but when we, but at the same time as a educational institution, it's just when we have that data, I think it's important to share the data and, and have people at least talking about it and being aware of it and, and taking some action as they can. So I don't know if there's any questions about that. It's usually all positive news for the principal's report, but I thought it was important to share some, some other important information as well that I know everybody will want to have. So. Thank you. Um, can I just ask a question? Forgive me that I don't know. I wasn't checking my email, but did you send that um, email to parents? Did you send it to the parents board kids. and the board? I sent it to the superintendent. I sent it to all parents, all high school parents and students. Uh, oh, and I did want to say that the letter was was vetted by a whole bunch of people: social workers, <laughs> um, school counselors, the chief of police. Uh, RSRO. So if you haven't gotten it, I'd be glad. I, I'm just wondering I if you can it. forward it on so that all school board members, if they don't have somebody in the high school, can, I can, I can send that be, be able to see that okay. as well. Sure. We'd we'll be yeah. glad to do that. Okay. Thank you for that information. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up, Dell. Good evening. Um, I don't have a whole lot that I'm able to share with you, but uh, I want to speak a little bit about professional development. I tried to speak a little bit about what we're doing during early releases. Um, so last week, uh, during early release, we have started what will be a series of kind of transition meetings for the students who are transitioning either from Pond Cove to middle school or from middle school to high school. This past week, uh, the Pond Cove special education teachers and related service providers met with the middle school teachers and special uh, related service providers. To start that process, um, we're trying to have the transitions for our students be as seamless as possible, and the more information we can share, the usually the better that transition ends up being. Um, I also want to review, we currently have 169 students in special education. Um, those of you paying attention to that number, it has crept up just a little bit. Um, we are still at about 10.5% um, as far as the number of students receiving special services. The last time that I heard from the state, the state average was 18.5, I believe, and it may be even higher than that at this time. Some districts are well into the 20s. But so we're doing well at holding the line, but it has crept up. Um, kind of to give you the big picture, we do have uh, eight students that are slated to graduate this year. We have 20 students moving up from middle school to high school. We currently have 17 students that will be moving from Pond Cove to middle school. And we also have 12 students coming in from Child Development Services. Um, we have 21 students that are in the referral pipeline. And we have three students that are outplaced. Thank you, Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm so relieved the dog is still here. Let's see if I have to. Have you turned that on? Okay, great. I am not going to talk about professional development. <laughs> um, so you may know that we have a new website. Uh, we had a soft launch at the start of this calendar year. Uh, we're going to have a formal launch to the website and the app on February 27th, and I thought in the meantime I would give you a little introduction to the website. So as soon as it comes up, I wonder if we could darken the lights in front of you. Can you see that okay? Oh, I guess it's okay now. Okay, good. All right. Um, <clears throat> So I'm just going to go through the features of the website, and if you want to interrupt me at any point, um, say stop, wait, what did you just do, that's fine. Um, so when you, um, when you go to our website, it's going to open to this page. It does default to the uh, Cape Elizabeth School Department page. Um, we actually have four sites currently. So if you go up to the top under Sites and click that drop-down menu, you'll see that in addition to the school department, you have Pond Cove, the middle school, and the high school. And we are in the process of building an athletic site. 
To the right, you have this button that says English. If you click that, then you will see all of the languages of our English learners. Um, any language that um, is available in Google Translate is available to us in terms of having our website translated. Um, so I personally am just really happy about that. To the Can you right. Click on one of those? Do I sign it? Can I? Oh. Get <laughs> or Arabic. Or Arabic. Okay. Ooh. So. Oh, I, I should have, there, there we go, okay. Oh, that's fantastic. I'm assuming it's accurate. You don't know? <laughs> do you still want to see Icelandic or should I go on? I kind of do, okay. <laughs> All right, oh, you can tell us if it's accurate. I hope that says welcome to Cape Elizabeth. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, Nasser? Yeah. I'm going to continue in English, though, if that's okay. <laughs> All right, thanks. So then to the right of that, you have the search bar. Um, okay, something to keep in mind in terms of the sites that I forgot to mention is that um, the interface on each site is the same, so you can get confused if you don't pay attention. So just remember, just to, if, if you're feeling a little lost, to double check that you're on the site that you think that you're on. Um, and people who are regularly visiting one of the school sites may just want to bookmark that site, because again, when you go to the, to the school department page, it's going to open to the school department page. Okay, um, so this picture is called our gallery, and we can have any number of pictures on there. We have been told that the more pictures we have, the slower the load times will be, so we'll try to keep that to a minimum, but, um, but we're thinking sort of in the four to six range, and it'll scroll through. And then the words are our gallery, and you see that, or I'm sorry, our bulletin board. So we have the link right there, because everyone wants to know about the budget. Um, but we'll also be posting school closings there as well for people who don't get the notifications. OK, then each site has news events and live feed. Uh, news would be your longer articles about things that are going on in the schools. Say, for example, the high school principal had written a letter to parents about the results of a recent survey. That would be a good place to inform uh, the community about that. And then um, the events, that's synced to our Google Calendar. So on the school department site, it's synced to the public facing um, calendar, uh, um, the external facing public calendar. And then on the, um, the school sites, it's synced to those school calendars. And uh, let's see, then live feed is your Twitter equivalent. Um, you are limited, I think, to 280 char characters. So, and as people get more familiar with um, how to post, and it's really easy to post, we hope to see many more news articles and many more tweet like live feeds. Um, then at the bottom, you'll see that um, there's a link to our Facebook page and a link to the, our Twitter page. And then there's also, um, you can also download the app either from uh, the Google Store or the Apple Store there. OK, so then the only button I haven't talked about is this button here, um, the menu button. I'm going to ignore the buttons there for now. But this is where the bulk of our content is going to live. This is for, in, for static information that doesn't change a lot, unlike, say, a news article or um, even a, a live feed that's, that's, that's more rapid. So some things I wanted to point out, um, and you can see the, the heading, central office, nutrition services. Oops. Um, community school board, health services, special services, HR, and teaching and learning. Um, the calendars are linked here. Those are also on the um, school pages. I'm sorry, the school sites. So you could choose the current calendar or the calendar that you approve for next year. 
Um, school building committee for people who are interested in that is right here. So you'd click on that and you'd get all of the information that's been posted so far. Um, there of course is our school board, so we have our policies, we have all the meeting information. Um, we're in the process of transitioning that information over from the town site where it currently lives, it will eventually live here. I just want to mention for those of you uh, who at home who haven't seen this, but we have bios and pictures of our school board members. Nice. Okay. Um, and then something else I'll mention is that if you click on some of these headings right now, um, nothing will come up. That we are we are in the process of adding content. Um, I particularly encourage you not to spend a lot of time in the teaching and learning section right now. That's coming. Um, yeah, okay, I'm just gonna move on. So uh, I wanted to now go to the high school site to show you a couple of things. So again, notice um, how much it looks like the school department site. It's a different picture. It says welcome to the high school instead of to the school department, but you have your news, your events, your live feed. Um, and then on the menu, there's a couple of things that are different from, um, the buttons are slightly different. So news, events, and live feed up at the top, those are shortcuts to those sections that I mentioned. Dining is where you to go, to, and this is true of all the school sites, to access the school menus. Power school is the shortcut to the student and parent login. And and then staff, I think this is really cool, but so let's say that you remembered you had a conversation with that social studies teacher, but you don't remember that teacher's name. You can go over here, right now it's showing all of the high school staff, but if you click here, you can filter. So I go to social studies, and look at that, there's all the social studies Thank you. teachers. That's nice. Thank you, thank so, you. And that's true um, of all of the sites. So if you know that you're, well, I would hope you know the name of your child's third grade teacher, but let's just suppose you didn't. Um, you could filter for third grade and it would come up, or you can filter for content area, et cetera. Are we working to get pictures of teachers up there as well, hopefully? I think the best way to get people who may not want to have their picture taken, taken, is for say, someone like a parent or a community member to say, boy, it would be great to have your picture up on the website. Some of them don't want their pictures on. And also, um, it did mean having to walk down to facilities and have your picture taken and people get busy and so. So I, I can't assume that everybody who doesn't have their picture up there doesn't want to have their picture, I think. I guess I would just like to encourage teachers yeah. to be willing to do that. I didn't want my picture up either, and I did it. Yeah. Yes, so yes. Major. And yours is much bigger than their thumbnail. Exactly. So if you right. guys can do it, wall. did you see that? And yes. you didn't change the paint for a minute. <laughs> it was up there for a long time. <laughs> um, anyway, I think it can be very helpful to uh, parents yeah. and yeah, I agree. perspectives. So I just would encourage people to make that little effort if possible, so teachers. Kind of yeah. But I understand as well. So then the other thing I wanted to mention is under parents, guardians, again, that parents, guardians heading, we tried to exist on all three school sites. We tried to keep the headers the same, just to make it easy if, easier if you had students in multiple schools. Um, so you see the nutrition services payment portal, um, registration information, volunteering. So I expect this is a place where, where parents would spend a lot of time. Um, middle school and Pond Cove are currently the only sites that, uh, they don't have the student site because pretty much things that students would need to know would be contained within school information. It makes sense that at the high school level there would be things that, like Naviance for example, that high school students are gonna wanna be able to access. And there's also a link to athletics for them under students and the, the link to the athletics while we're building the athletics site is under school information on the other two schools. But, um, which I guess my point here really is spend a little time just exploring and getting to know where the, where the content is located. And we tried to make it as logical as possible, um, but that doesn't mean that 
you won't need to invest a little bit of time in just getting building familiarity. And finally, we are uh, in the process of working on instructions with pictures, like those circles with arrows that show you to click here and then click here and click here. And we'll be sending those out to parents with um, when we formally launch what I have just shown you. So there's still time for to, to receive feedback? Oh, yeah. Okay. Is there, has there been well, okay, let me just back up a little oh, bit. Sorry, I, 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 there, I, there, there, is a, there is a lot that is hardwired in that correct, we don't yeah. have the ability certain to change. Certain things cannot change, and content can definitely change. Content can definitely and can change. Move around and all that. Correct. Um, was there ever a need for an internal, because this is public facing, is there ever a need for an internal website where the teachers can log in and can chat with one another? Uh, as well as, I noticed that there's forms over there, but there could be some forms for them to fill up for vacation, sick time, notification, <laughs> letting people know that way. So, um, so I'm going to answer your question with a couple of examples. So, on the Pond Cove site, there is, under staff, um, there's a staff handbook. You can only access that staff handbook if you have a Cape Elizabeth School staff and address. So it's only shared with Cape Elizabeth staff. So it's something that it's on, it's on this public website, but it's, it's, it's easy for teachers to access, but there's information in there, like security information, that we wouldn't want available to the general public. Um, the forms, some of them are password protected and some are not. Um, so I don't know if that fully answers your question, but. No. And as far as communicating, so logging on, when you click on this tab, does it allow you to log in? Or how you, this is public facing right now, right? Correct. But when you click on that tab. So I'm not gonna do that because oh. I am logged in, so it would pull it up okay. on my computer. Okay. So you can check so that at home. In. So where did you log in is the question. Where did I log into the website? Yeah. Um, Okay, so well, this is a no, wait, I'm not, I'm sorry, I'm not logged into the website, I'm logged. Uh, you're seeing the internal stuff. Right? Correct. Okay, you're yeah. seeing the yeah. stuff that you've been worked on, okay. I'm logged into the, I have the ability to log into the handbook okay. right now without yeah. having to, okay. I don't know how to explain it. <laughs> no, but for when the public faces the, on the top right hand corner, they may have a sign in. So, their parents do not have to sign in. Okay. Teachers have to sign in if they're going to load content. Well, it's, it, I think it's similar, if I can interrupt, I think it's similar to if I were to go in there and go to the power school, I'd have to log in to get right. into the power school of my own child. So it seems like if there was a staff member that was going in to fill out certain forms, they might have to log in with their Cape Elizabeth website address. Correct. To be able to access that information. Correct. Right. So the staff handbook is a Google form, uh, is a, a Google doc. And so to access that Google doc, right. you have to log in. You have right. to be logged in on your Cape Elizabeth school's address. If I try to, if I try to access that, that um, staff handbook I'm a, and I'm on my personal Gmail account, it's not going to let me in. Right. Yeah. Although, boy, if you can get into that staff handbook right now. Of course, you have a Cape Elizabeth School's address, too, so. Worth checking. Are you going to say anything about the app? Um, it's available. It's, it's, yeah, I mean, it, it is available to you now. You can download it, um, but like the the posters announcing it and that we're super excited. That's all part of the formal launch on the 27th. Thank you so much. Oh, this yeah, is you're welcome. a huge improvement from how it used to be. I'm grateful for the time of the various members. Kathy's um, worked hard on this website. Yeah, yeah a lot of thank people you. who have put in a lot of time for it, so thank you. We have Marcy. Hi, good evening, everyone. So your charts tonight 
like a colored bar chart, shows us at the typical spending percentage as of January 31st would be 58%. And at the far right, you'll see that the total general fund spent is at 56%. So we're still doing good, holding strong. Last year at this time, we were at 55% spent for general fund monies. So I wanna just point out to you what that difference would be. If you look at your chart, right next to the general fund green arrow, there are two, two items that might you know, call your attention. One of them is the facilities maintenance costs. That is, you know, it's in the, um, the one that's for facilities maintenance. That's up higher because the actual repairs and maintenance expenses right now are at 86% spent. Last year at this time, they were at 75% spent. So that's causing us to go up a little higher. So we're really trying to keep that holding strong. So that's, that's a, a challenge right now, especially since we're in the middle of February. Mm -hmm. So that's going to be our, our focus. The next one, ne right next to it, as you can see, this jumped up in the yellow. Don't be afraid. That's just, that's where school nutrition lives. That's the category for school nutrition. There's a one-time transfer that we make from the general fund to subsidize the school nutrition program. And so we've made that transfer in total. So don't be afraid. That's just done now. And then that won't move up very much further for the rest of the year. So that now we can have an accurate picture for on the school nutrition side after this. That's good to know. Okay. Yes. Going forward, and this is probably for Donna and um, Marcy, will we move um, the nutrition into its own line or deal with it in a different way so that we don't have this sort of big one time? So or will there have, be discussion about it? We or? have started to deal with it in a different way, and Marcy, maybe you want to explain that a little bit? Yes, yeah, so we are approaching that into the new budget year. We definitely have to have school nutrition as its own separate fund, segregated for the state purposes for accounting, and so the importance of that is, is continuing that, and we have that. Excellent. Right now, we are moving forward to having the monies, at least one transfer done at the beginning of the year, just one in entirety going into school nutrition. Uh, that's mostly what's done. Our other alternative is to have the monies go directly into the school nutrition fund itself. So we're, we're moving towards that and um, that's definitely what other schools tend to do as well. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy. So I have good news tonight. It's always nice to give good news. Uh, we received our ED 279s, which is our state subsidy report, late in January, and we were notified of an increase from the state um, of $36,321 over FY20, so that's really good news. And uh, just to note, $44,415 of that amount, of the total amount, is a result of our participation in the Greater Sebago Education Alliance, so which is our region service center. So we are seeing a benefit um, from that and we do, um, I, I continue to meet uh, with that education association every month and uh, it's alive and well and um, we're doing lots of things together so um, it's very worthwhile. Uh, more good news is about our um, revolving renovation grant. We uh, did, we had 12 applications and we received uh, approval of six of those uh, projects, and those were projects that were identified in the needs assessment report, um, and they total $390,429. One project will be in Plum Cove, one will be in the middle school, and four will be at the high school. Um, and if you'll remember, 30% of the funding of those projects will be forgiven by the state, and that's $117,128.70, so that's like, free money. <laughs> Um, and the remaining 70% will be paid back at a 0% interest rate, which is $54,660.06 over five years. 
Um, the state granted awards for debt service help our state subsidy in the future. That's taken into um, our state subsidy account. Um, moving forward uh, for the five years uh, when we're paying off the debt. So that will help us with sub subsidy. Uh, according to the state requirements, we are advertising now for RFQs, re requests for qualifications uh, from professional engineering and licensed architectural firms. So we have to, um, we have to advertise twice. Um, and um, so we will hold interviews um, with, those firms that we select to interview um, and choose a firm uh, based on the interview. So we'll have to have an interview committee. So you, you may be called on to do the interview committee. <laughs> um, the third piece of good news we just found out yesterday is that the state has awarded us, us a type, one type C bus. So we applied for a bus grant and we got it. So we will purchase the bus um, next year and then the state following year, year will reimburse us. Um, so that is a value of $95,990.40. So um, that was really, Marcy texted me last night and let me know, so that was really good. And it's a smaller bus um, and that we can use to carry small groups of students, for example, the groups, the, the group of students that go to PAS or smaller field trips. Um, so that bus will really come in handy. So small as 12 passengers? 12 passengers, right. Oh, I'm not sure about that. I said that. I think it's 12 fashions, but I'm not sure. It is a bus, though. It's not a van. It's a bus. Um, so, it's good news. Um, and uh, you have the enrollment sheet in your packet. Uh, we have dropped 13 students from last year at this time, but, um, but really, in the grand scheme of things, is holding pretty steady. So, any questions? Thank you and Mars both so much for applying for these grants for the, the bus and the uh, school improvements. I appreciate it. We're trying. <laughs> Those 13 students are from through our school, so any specific school, middle school, high school. Oh, that's great. Drop, they should do it. Oh, uh, well, you'll see the chart and you can see where the, the specific drops are. So okay. if you look at, have a look at that chart. And that's yeah. just from last year, that's not from last month. Pardon me, from last year, yeah. yeah. Five from last month. I wanted to echo Kimberly's sentiments and mostly because I think even professionals that work here are told, oh, Cape Elizabeth will never get that money. Don't bother applying, don't even try. We keep getting told this. And I think that it bears kind of celebrating the fact that you and Marcy said, I don't, and it doesn't matter that you think we're not going to get the money. We're going to try. And um, I think it's fantastic that, that you know, we had this opportunity mostly due to our um, needs assessment and our, our cooperation with Colby Company and engineers and the Scott Simons architects being ready to do this. But, you know, you found this. You saw that it was sort of quietly announced in July and we were prepared and Marcy was always scanning and looking and talking and going and, and working on this. So and I believe that you know every nickel helps and um, I'm so appreciative that we sort of aren't listening to the naysayers that we're going out and just trying and doing what we can. Thank you. You'll never get it if you don't ask, so it's That's right. <laughs> I have um, a quick question about the, what is it, the Greater Sebago Education mm -hmm. Association. Uh, if you can just speak a little bit to um, how long we've been in that, because it hasn't been very long. This is the second year. Right, mm -hmm. and um, I think that's just a testament again to what Elizabeth was just mentioning, the going after. Could you just explain a little bit to the public what it is and why we're saving money by so being a part of it? So it's made of a group of, I believe there's 12 different districts now. Um, and um, the purpose of the group is to find areas where we can work together. For example, professional development. Um, often, um, uh, say the phys ed department is kind of uh, in each district an entity uh, unto itself. And so uh, right now um, they're planning on um, 
uh, Greater Sebago Education Alliance Professional Development Day in March, where all of the phys ed teachers from the areas get together and uh, have professional development. And there's, uh, there's special education um, uh, efforts. Um, the special ed directors meet and they've been talking a lot about um, the, the children coming from uh, CDS and um, the uh, services that we have to provide, um, transportation. There's a, a real problem uh, in our area of uh, transporting students to special schools, so there's been some partnerships with doing that. Um, food services working together um, to get um, better prices on different things. So there's, there's all kinds of efforts that are, that are moving forward um, as a result of this. So That's great. Lots I, going on. I With think it's fabulous and I think it's just warranting mentioning in a little more detail, so thank you. Anything else? That's it, come on. Okay. Uh, new business. Right, um, that's where we are, correct? Yes. Uh, may I have a motion, please? I move we approve the request for sabbatical for Laura Briggs. May I have a second? Second. second. Uh, any discussion? I think as some of the discussion, we'd like to invite Laura up to talk once again about what she's planning. Mm. In your packets, you have a description of the process and Laura's proposal um, information that you need. So Donna asked me to share a few comments with you. I'll try to keep it brief, so because yeah. I think many of you were here, uh, but perhaps not all of you when I was here in November. Uh, my name is Laura Briggs, and I'm in my ninth year of teaching sixth grade social studies and language arts at the middle school. Uh, I'm also a long-term parent in this district, although my youngest graduated in 2016, so I'm starting to feel like mm -hmm. far away from that now. Um, and back in November, I did come and request permission to take a one-semester sabbatical in the spring of 2021. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that opportunity for both personal renewal as well as professional renewal. Uh, on a personal level, my husband and I hope to do a little bit of traveling. And professionally, I'm really excited about a proposal that I have uh, for the district. What I'd like to do is spend most of my sabbatical developing a new class. It would be an integrated social studies and language arts class for eighth graders that would focus largely on the topic of immigration and migration movements within the United States. The social studies curriculum at eighth grade is a US history curriculum, so I would tie it into that curriculum. And I feel it fits very well with language arts as well. There's many, many uh, pieces of literature uh, and uh, opportunities to discuss issues related to immigration. Uh, as I'm thinking about designing the class, I have three major principles that are kind of guiding my thinking. Uh, the first is that I'm interested in engagement. How do we engage our students more in what we're doing? Uh, I think that engagement in history involves connecting the past to the present so that our kids really see why understanding our history can help us understand what's going on today. I think engagement also involves using creative ways to get kids more involved in what we're doing. In social studies, that often comes to creating simulations, debates, um, historical reenactments, dramatic reenactments, uh, writing letters to the editor, going on field trips, inviting speakers in. I want to create a class where there's lots of this type of engaging activity for our eighth graders. The second piece is rigor. Um, this is a really um, competitive school district, and I think we pride ourselves. Uh, I know I sent my children to this school district because of the quality of education here. And I think we owe it to our middle schoolers, our eighth graders, to really have a rigorous curriculum. They're going to high school in a year. I want this class to not only be fun and engaging, but I want them to be doing a lot of writing, a lot of reading, and a lot of research work. Um, I found even as a sixth grade teacher that when we ask our kids to rise to the occasion, they can do so much. And so I really see this class as being a way to push them to apply those skills and uh, to hold them to the high standard I know they're capable of doing. The third piece for me is connection. Uh, I want them to connect both past and present. I want them to connect between the global and the local when they study the story of other immigrants. Uh, that they think about their, their selves and their own individual journeys. How do I connect the global to the individual? And my final piece that I really want to connect them with is a personal connection. My goal 
and I feel it's somewhat ambitious, but I, I, that's why I need the sabbatical to do this. I really would like at the end of this class for every single, it would be about 45 kids, every single eighth grader in that class to make a personal connection with an immigrant in the greater community. By that, I define that as Portland, Westbrook, South Portland. Um, you know, we have a lot of immigrants here in Portland. Uh, they range from people like my dad, who came here in the 1950s from South America, to asylum seekers who Claire Ramsbotham and I were teaching English to uh, this summer at the Expo Center, and everything in between. And what I'd like to really do is put our kids in touch with them. At first, I thought I would be doing that perhaps through uh, community service work. I'm stepping back from that a little bit, thinking it may be more uh, field research. Uh, my, one of my concerns as I began to think logistically of how to do that was, how am I going to get 45 eighth graders to do community service when they don't even drive? So, um, but I'm thinking uh, some type of a field research project where they actually meet with immigrants in the community, learn their stories, interview them, make the connections, and begin to see, gee, this story, person's story is quite different than my own, and this person's also very similar to me. And I feel like it would be an incredible experience for them in terms of really connecting to the community and applying their academic learning. Uh, to what's going on around us locally and within our nation. Um, really excited about it. My vision would be that I would take, again, the spring of 2021 off to do this work and come back in September ready to teach this class. And I'm glad to take any questions you may have. It sounds great. I'm, I'm excited for you. I'm excited for the, for the class. I think it'll be wonderful. I wish my kids hadn't gone through eighth grade yet. I have a couple more to come, but I think <laughs> three of yours, so one or yeah. two more. <laughs> two, two more. <laughs> they just keep coming. Yeah. Um, that's great. Well, why don't we take a vote if there's no more questions for Laura. All those in favor. Congratulations. Thank you. Really excited for you. Thank you. And for the district. Uh, next up, item 7B. Move we consider to approve the current proposed 2020 to 2023 administrative contract. Second. Any comments? Um, would Dell please come on up? So at this time, we are going to sign that contract, but on behalf of the school board and especially Hope Straw and myself, um, I just want to say thank you to the um, administrative negotiators. We felt like it was a very positive and productive negotiation, and we're um, happy to sign this contract. Well, and thank tonight. you, because we felt exactly the same way, and we really appreciated working with you folks. And uh, I thought we... Uh, covered a lot of ground in a very short period of time. Great. So thank you. Yeah. Before we vote, we'll sign it. She'll sign it, then we'll vote, I guess. So I'll sign one She's copy and oh, get to you, and then sign it do you first have a copy or do I you? I do not have a copy that has the signature page. All right, so Donna has that, if you don't mind. Sorry about the punch holes, but. <laughs> it's okay. So we'll just sign those in exchange. I don't think this one has a signature. There, check and see if it's, it's because on they're the double-sided. Oh, it might be on the back? No, it's a waiver for medical not, coverage. Oh, that's not the signature page? Sorry. No. Yeah, Board member should have it. It's on the back. Oh, no, that's the, that's the medical waiver. Sorry. I'm like, I have it. You, yeah, you can, have so you can sign well. her a copy. It's yeah, in the we'll make a copy yeah, of it. It's on page okay. eight in the middle. Because it's the appendix out here. Yeah. It's weird. Yeah. I looked beforehand, so I'd be prepared. Oh, there's, there's two. There's, 
Right, the back page is this. There's it? three Something. page eights, but <laughs> I found the one. Oh, yeah. Kind of, we'll fix that next time, though. <laughs> this agreement. Can't, we'll Elizabeth, is this the page you're looking at? He, yeah. he has oh, it. Oh, he's got it. We'll fix that next time. <laughs> So are we all set with discussion, we think? Anything else, any other comments? All those in favor? I would just like to say thank you to Hope and Elizabeth on behalf of the school board um, for all the work that you've done. Uh, I'm learning more and more how intense and extensive that time commitment can be, so I appreciate it. Um, and thank you to the administrators. It sounds like it was a great collaboration on both ends. Really appreciate it. Uh, next up, we have, can I have a movement, please? I move we approve the following 2019-2020 co-curricular stipends as defined in our packets. There are quite a few. Mm -hmm. So uh, can I have? Second. Thank you. Any questions or comments? It got really loud. I would just like to say once again, I appreciate those who step up for these roles um, after working a full day to then be out doing travel sports or um, even right here in Cape Elizabeth. It's much appreciated. I think it helps much like the eSports that we heard earlier, um, much like any of the activities, the mock trials, the, the concerts. Uh, this is just one avenue to expand your education here in Cape Elizabeth and the support that comes from the adults that make it happen is wonderful. So thank you so much. Uh, all those in favor? Great. So we are skipping item D. Mm -hmm. Can we have a motion for 7E, please? I move we approve the Cape Elizabeth High School Outing Club field trip to Maine Forest Yurts in Durham, Maine on March 6th through 7th, 2020. I have a second. 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 Any questions, comments? Sounds like fun. That sounds really exciting. So all, um, all those in favor? Fantastic. All right, next up, item 7F. May I have a motion? I move we approve the Cape Elizabeth High School outing club field trip to Moxie Adventures Whitewater Rafting in West Forks, Maine on May 8th through the 9th, 2020. Second. Thank you. Any comments, discussion, questions? Again, sounds like a fun club. Yeah, All those there. in favor? Great. Uh, next up, are there any uh, school board agenda requests that we can take note of? And committee reports. Start with policy. Like I'm on, I'm on the You're on deck. So, mm -hmm. um, at long last, we have some policies emerging from the policy committee. So, uh, throughout the fall, we've been talking about a group of policies sort of under the umbrella of um, our sexual harassment policy and then the related policies around child abuse and then um, another related policy around child sexual abuse. 
Um, these have been uh, very uh, informative discussions. There's been participation uh, widely across the district. We've had students, we've had many um, attendees from the staff, the psychologist, the school psychologist, the school guidance counselors, the school nurse. Um, the meetings have been very well attended, probably the best attended policy committee meetings I've, I've seen. Um, so uh, they were, they've been lengthy discussions and we sort of worked through a lot of different issues and ultimately at this point we're ready to move to a first reading of policy JLF, which is an existing policy, which is the reporting child abuse and neglect policy, as well as a new policy, and this is, a, this is something that's mandated by the state, um, and it's a policy we, we, we have to have in place as well, which is a, a kind of a specific subset of child abuse reporting, which is child sexual abuse prevention and reporting. So these two policies sort of, they, they mirror each other, but the sexual abuse policy gets a little bit more specific about um, elements of, of our obligations and different um, parties' obligations with respect to what happens when, it, when an individual comes to them with these issues or they become aware of them. So what we did was, um, uh, these are both based on the, the, um, the main school management association samples, and you'll see red lines in your packets of what we've done to sort of clarify and customize. They don't go very far afield from them because these are, these are sort of um, this outlines our, our obligations under the law effectively. Um, so the most notable uh, edits that we've done is we want to be very clear that when you're in this world of child abuse um, reporting, this is, this is what we, what, um, this is the policy you would look to if you're looking to the, to the mandatory reporting requirements. So that under the state statute, there's a, report, a requirement that if we become aware of, of a child that's potentially subject to abuse, um, there are triggering events where it must be reported to the district attorney or to the Department of Health and Human Services. Um, so in that policy, we also want to make sure that when we're, when a staff member or a family or, or, or a student is looking at this, they can, they know that there's also another related policy. So we've added references to the JLFA, which is the Child Sexual Abuse uh, Prevention Response Policy. Um, aside from that, um, there's really, there's some, you know, kind of tweaks we've made with respect to how our district works in terms of it being employees or volunteers who may have, um, you know, may need to be making reference to the policies. Um, and other than that, there's not sort of, not really any substantive changes that we're suggesting to these policies. Um, does anyone have any questions on what you're looking at here in terms of the first reading? We're not voting on these tonight. No. This is just our first review. So um, you can still ask questions, but I'll keep going. Um, <laughs> so next, this coming month, at the end of February, we'll have a, a follow-up meeting where we can we can revisit these edits, and they'll come back to the board for, for a vote next month for adoption. At the upcoming meeting, we're also going to be revisiting, um, we're looking, still looking at ACAA, which is the Critical Sexual Harassment um, uh, Policy. Um, and what we're going to be doing at that meeting, and this, I'm sharing this with the public because it's been sort of a, a, a topic of discussion for the district, um, we're looking to clarify within that policy um, uh, the district's understanding of certain staff members who have confidentiality requirements under their own licensing, um, uh, licensing under the state. So there's certain staff members, uh, licensed social workers, uh, licensed psychologists, who have confidentiality requirements under, to maintain their licensure. So what we want to do is um, we want to address that and, and, and acknowledge as a board that those staff members have those requirements under the ACA policy. And there are only certain very, you know, sort of limited circumstances where that might not, might be, there might be an exception to that. And that's when the mandatory reporting requirement is triggered, if, if there's child abuse, if it's a case of child abuse involved in that report. So what the board, um, I'm sorry, what the committee is going to do is we'll talk about that at the, at the meeting at the end of this month and hopefully we'll bring a revised version of ACAA for a first read next month to the board. 
Um, and in doing so, I think I, I'm hopeful that with you know the adoption of these two, and then eventually of ACAA, we sort of covered um, you know the, the open issues that have been we've been tackling for a few months now. Questions? Thank you for that update. Yep. Thank you. Thank you also, Hope, for all the time that you put into this policy, the thoroughness and care that you've taken in looking at it. Technology Committee? We have a met. We have a met. Paz, we don't have an update there. Student Wellness, Buildings and Grounds. I guess I'm on Take that. Take it away. I guess I'm on that. <laughs> Uh, we had a meeting uh, on February 4th, and it was quite beneficial, um, I think. We talked about the mission, uh, or the charge, as well as connecting and reminding us of the future search, uh, which compiled uh, opinions from about 100 members of the community in order to bring them down to, I believe it was five goals. Uh, that we are taking as the will of the community based on the member uh, participation uh, a year ago last February. Um, and we recognize that two of those goals were based, if you can hold one second, I'd actually like to refer to it. Okay. Yay, I do have it. Um, sorry, just one second, please, and I'll be able to find it. Um, of course, I don't have it. Well, we talked about the. Sorry, I'm not totally familiar with this right now. No, I don't have it. Do you remember what the strategic goals are? I don't have them right on the strategic plan goals that both safe and effective buildings. It was safe and effective buildings. Global and then, competence. Oh, the ones and then we address. Environmental. Environmental. Yeah. Environmental right. responsibility and stewardship. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was great. I was and hoping to actually read the words, but yeah. I don't have them on me. I'm close. Oh, no, I You're think close. she wants Oh, they're right here. Goals. I do have them. Okay, first one that we were referring to was safe, sustainable, and effective facilities. And it mentions our schools will be safe and effective facilities. They will upgrade, be updated and maintained to meet the needs of students and staff in accordance with long-term financial planning. And the other strategic goal that we were referring to was environmental responsibility. The school department will prioritize uh, environmental responsibility, including stewardship and sustainability. And so just reminding us, uh, Superintendent Wolf from uh, read and talked about those strategic goals, saying that that should really uh, be in the center of our decision making. Uh, what is the will of this district as we come up with um, uh, an eventual recommendation? We then broke up into uh, groups, small groups of five or six people, and um, talked about what does safe mean? What does effective facilities mean? What is our environmental responsibility as a district? And what is our financial responsibility to the district and the community? We got together then and had a nice conversation, sharing ideas and putting it all together into lists um, based on what the different groups came up with. Uh, and I think the small group work was beneficial. Lots of voices could be heard and everybody or most people, I would say, felt like they could participate. Um, we then reviewed uh, a document, that a chart, uh, that Marcy, I think, had put together for us and Superintendent Wolfram uh, based on uh, the needs assessment that was completed and the items that were considered read. And I believe there were like around 45 items, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, and I would just like to, you know, say to the public that um, red, what does red mean? My interpretation based on what I heard from 
the engineers, Colby engineers and the architects is that um, red is kind of like a, it should have been done yesterday kind of category. Um, so uh, just throwing that out there. Yeah, we didn't even look at yellow. We didn't even is, look at yellow, which is needs to be done. Needs to be done, done thing. But, um, not on, but not on fire we'll yet. But, right, right. We'll become red soon. Yeah. Right. So I think it's, I think it's interesting, and I also would like to bring up, and I, I might be wrong, Marcy, when you were talking about the, the chart about where we are in spending, you said what percentage are we at with our facility spending right now? Is it 83, 80, 86? So. Um, We'll have to look into that a little bit more, maybe at the next building committee, about what that number means and why we're at 86. My guess is that things are failing and needing help now and can't wait. Yes, just to confirm she's shaking her head yes. <laughs> um, so then from there, after having that little conversation, or not little, after having that com conversation, we did go about, uh, Colby and company did present with, to us um, a document, and by no means was it exhaustive, but it was for potential options, um, and all we did was look through that. I just want to read what the options were. One was uh, a phased lower school and middle school building replacement. Uh, that was option number one. Option two was uh, concurrent lower school and middle school building replacement. Option three, framed off restoration and renovation of the existing lower and middle school, which I just think is important to uh, add to that, that if uh, th an option like that were to happen, um, 40 portables would need to be housed somewhere in the town to allow that to happen, that work to happen. And then option four would be security and cafetorium updates. Um, all of these include a little bit of update um, to the high school as well. We're not leaving you out, Jeff, so don't worry. Um, and our hope is that in the next meeting to dig a little bit of deeper into They're all of that. They're available on the website. Too. They're all, those, um, those documents are available on the website under building committee and our new web page there. I'm sure it'll be easy to find. Um, and we have a next meeting coming up. It is Wednesday, March 4th at 6.30 up uh, over in the high school library. Mm -hmm. Anything else for those of you uh, that were there? I believe it was video too, right? It was yes. videotaped yes. as well, so you are uh, able to go back. Um, and, and review some of the conversation that we have. Yeah, thank you, Nasser. And legislative liaison. Uh, no updates. No updates. Great. Could I, mm -hmm. maybe we want to just mention our high school visit at this point? We forgot. To that would be great. Bring it in early. Yeah. Do you want to speak to it? Sure. Um, I guess we'll start with thank you so much, uh, Mr. Shedd, for uh, having Heather Altenberg and um, and myself uh, come and tour the high school on Thursday, I think it was, last week. Um, we both had the um, opportunity to, to go and observe three classes um, and then had a student-led tour of the, of the facilities. Um, and I think, um, speaking for myself, I just came away um, impressed again um, with all that we are offering, um, the dynamic um, extracurricular programs that we have, um, the list of things that the three students um, identified that participating in was extensive and varied. Um, and it, and it was uh, it was a real joy to, to see the teachers in action as well. So thank you. I appreciate you um, creating space for us to do that. I'd like to um, add on to that that it was really a wonderful experience, and that um, I have heard through various committees and. Um, groups that I've been involved with here on the board, various teachers saying, we'd love to have you come visit our school, we'd love to have you come visit our school, and um, 
it was always an intention and it never sort of unless you make it a priority and make it happen it's 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 hard to actually get in there and go do it uh, just because all of our lives are so full so the conversation started at a workshop last November and um, in this you know, then the holidays happened, and um, Mr. Shebb was quite accommodating to to welcome us in. And I would just like to say that there, the the purpose and the the call for this uh, these visits and this interaction, which was clearly, I believe, understood by the teachers that we visited, but just for the public to know, it was not observation. It was not anything formal. It was just to create. Um, more connection and understanding for um, us to see what's going on in the schools so that we understand a little bit better, um, to just create a better relationship, more visibility. And uh, my hope is that we'll head into the middle school and Pond Cove, uh, if that's something comfortable. Uh, we don't want this to be anything that feels intimidating because that's, that's not the purpose in the least. Uh, and we had a really great experience in the high school. I think both Kimberly and I would say that unanimously. And, um, you know, based on there's other board members who are interested, so it, it could be a variety of ways that this can unfold. But I would love to keep this going. I think it's a great practice. Um, and I think it just leads to more connection and a stronger relationship and understanding from both sides. So. Yes, I would like to thank you again, Mr. Shedd. Anything else? We have some upcoming meetings. The next policy meeting is February 25th um, at 3 o'clock in the Jordan Conference Room. Our next school board meeting is February 25th at 6.30, busy day, uh, in the high school library. Um, and that is the budget workshop. Uh, which Let's will be put a reminder out that people have exciting, if any yeah. people have questions to please email those questions to me at least three days before so I would say try to aim for the end of February vacation if you can but if not then um, the 22nd so that I can sort of collate and compile and then send those questions out to the appropriate administrators and directors. Mm -hmm. Sorry to jump in. No, it was a good moment, moment, though. It was a good moment. Uh, and I'm going to jump on that and just let the public know that uh, they're welcome to come. We were previously given the initial uh, budget that had been presented from all the different administrators, and I think a bunch of us were sort of chomping at our bit because we do have some questions, and but we were being respectful. And what? There's your budget books. And there's our budget book. Uh, we wanted to get through it and let them present and present without interruption. And so this next meeting is the opportunity for us to come with some questions ahead of time and have those questions answered. Um, and that too will be videotaped and online to access again. Um, I'd also like, it's not on this, uh, on the agenda materials, but a reminder that the building committee meeting is, uh, it's a Wednesday, it has been on Tuesdays, it's Wednesday, March 4th at 6.30 over in the high school library. And um, I'd like to say that uh, if you are coming and you're not on the committee, it is a large committee, but if you're coming and on the committee, when we break up into groups, we in include you. You're not sitting in the sidelines watching us all talk, but uh, you get to be a part of it as well. So we encourage people to come and have their voices heard and uh, participate in the discussion, uh, especially if you have opinions about where the future of these buildings um, are headed. So anything else? Any other meetings that might have been forgotten? Mm -hmm. Um, no meetings, but I will. I don't know if there's probably a session missing uh, where we can add to an agenda for next time. Oh. Uh, but it doesn't have to go to agenda. There's a question that and a concern that I have, and uh, I would like to have someone at the school district address it and what they're doing in the school in reference to coronavirus. Oh. Um, as far as how we're educating the kids to wash their hands and you know, having hygiene, are we announcing the assemblies? Um, if something has ha does happen, how do we uh, uh, continue that? And more importantly, because 
the way it is, the reality is that it's happening in China. So we, as a result, are being target certain group of people as well. So we want to make sure that certain jokes are not shared mm -hmm. and uh, that. So I would like to know what's the school doing around that. Okay. Thank you for that, Nasser. Anything else? Okay, at this time, may I have a movement for item 11? I move that we enter into executive session pursuant to 1 MRSA 40568 to consider the administrative evaluation of the superintendent of schools. Second. All those in favor? So at this time, we'll adjourn and come back. Thank you so much. I like to test. Oh, you need to go study.
On air, we're ready to get going. So we're back in session. And I was told that I'm gonna make this motion. Um, I move, we certify the contract for the superintendent of schools, Donna H. Wolfram, for the 2020-2021 school year. Can I have a second? Second. Any discussion? We're delighted yeah. for you to mm -hmm. stay. <laughs> Thank we you. Enjoy working with you. Thank you. I enjoy being here. Uh, yeah, I would just like to reiterate that and say that um, the district seems and feels stronger and steadier and all those arrows going in the right direction with you at the lead, so much appreciated. All those in favor? Yes, congratulations. Uh, may I have a motion for item 13, please? I move we adjourn. Second. All those in favor, any discussion? <laughs> All those in favor? All right, have a good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. I did.